So this is a master class that covers the three zones of respiration. I call this the Body by Breath Masterclass. And it just helps to bring some of the principles within the, the book into their body. So it's not just living on the pages. Because physio physiological relaxation, like we can talk about it and we'll talk about it, I'm sure, for hours today. But it's an experience that you have to actually have. And a lot of people know how to go from zero to 60. It's really easy. We're really sympathetically driven. Um, but going from 60 to zero in stages without having a breakdown, without crashing and burning, is a little more challenging. So I'm teaching them relaxation as a skill. And we're doing it through the lens of these zones of respiration. Thank you for welcoming me here. What I'm going to be doing with you all for about an hour is a class that introduces your body to progressive physiological relaxation. I'm scared. These are all exercises from my book, Body by Breath, The Science and Practice of Physical and Emotional Resilience. And we're going to look at this through a lens of, of pressure, through self-massage, uh, through position, and through a little bit of mindset work coupled with breath work. In Body by Breath, there are four tools that we use, primary tools, to induce parasympathetic dominant states. And that's breathe, roll, move, and then non-sleep deep rest or yoga nidra. We're going to do three of those. We're not going to be doing yoga nidra. That takes a long time. But you'll be in an ideal place by the end of this class to actually perform yoga nidra. The tools that you have are two inflated gorgeous balls, and you have this pair of yoga tone up balls. And we're going to start by going through, we're going to do this whole practice by addressing what I call the three zones of respiration. So there's three zones of respiration, and you can find zone one by putting your hands below your rib cage and letting your fingers come towards your belly button and your thumbs come around your back. You can sit in any position you want. This is just to give you an idea of the, of the mapping of where we're going to be going. And you can just start to breathe right now into your hands, really simply. You've probably all done this before and tried to generate a feeling of motion in this below the rib cage zone. And when we are breathing in a zone one type of breath, what we're feeling is the pressure of the diaphragm upon all the stuff below it, which are all the myofascia, the muscle layers and the fascial tissues connecting them. And of course, this massive organ bag. When you're doing zone one breathing, you're in your calmest state. This is breaths at rest, breaths at rest type of breathing, calm. Zone two breathing is the stuff of the rib cage. So if you bring your hands if you can internally rotate your shoulders enough <laughs> that you can actually uh, sort of claw your paws so that the, the fingers reach forward and the thumbs reach back. And now, you, yeah, you can also do this just by giving yourself a hug. If yeah, I reach around <laughs> and... <laughs> and There's all kinds of complications, yeah. Yes, but we're, the, this is gonna be really fun to do with you because you're, you're gonna see some range of motion changes just with very, very simple techniques. So here in zone two, the diaphragm is involved with breathing in this zone, but so are the intercostals. And when we're doing exclusive zone two breathing, which is what you're trying to do right now, just try not to let your diaphragm descend. So in order to not let your diaphragm descend, you have to create some rigidity in these below the rib cage muscles. And you're going to try to just favor the up and down motion of the thorax. Right. So you have 12 ribs on the right, 12 on the left, and they act like these oars that pump, they broaden up to bring air in and they descend to help air go out. Now this zone is our more sympathetic zone. This is our athletic zone. We need to breathe here in order to generate push power, pull power. And of course, when you're pushing and pulling and you guys have all the equipment here, you want to have tremendous bracing in zone one so that you're not lifting like this, right? And having, having your fanny go all about and then you lose your SI joint, you lose all four of your uh, five of your lumbar discs and then some. So we need to figure out good breathing mechanics here so that we don't, yeah, great. Then there's a third zone of respiration. The third zone of respiration is up here. So if you wrap your hands above your collarbones, on top of your collarbones and shoulders and surround your lateral neck, when we do a zone three breath, we're usually doing this as a, a last effort to get more air in or in case of emergency. The zone three breath looks like this. 
right? It's a quick draw. <gasps> Often it's accompanied by an open mouth. <gasps> and that can, be, that can happen in surprise, like happy stuff, like <gasps> or glee. Or it can be <gasps> in startle or fear. So zone three is usually very, very temporary. And it really is problematic if it becomes the default zone of breathing in bodies. Um, here's the, here's the, the challenge is that dominant zone two breathers often will default frequently to become a zone three because they're in this heightened up state more often of the time. And they're not necessarily getting uh, a sort of a blended zone one, zone two relationship. The other thing about the zone three breathing is that a lot of our modern day uh, cho work choices and life choices center around this pet. Yeah. Do you have this pet? <laughs> right? I literally don't even, I'm not even holding my phone, but my hand is so proprioceptively tuned to the shape of my device. Like I know that tension pattern from here through here through here all the way up through zone three. And so we end up having a, a number of fascial and muscular tension adaptations because of that cleave to, to tech. Um, and tech's neck is not an insignificant, uh, you know, cute diagnosis. There are changes happening in young children and young adults and older adults because of that. Um, and that compromises breathing. It compromises airway. All right, so that's kind of the outline of the zones. We're going to address each of them. But we're going to start here. You're just going to lay back on your backs. All of this with the goal of profound physiological relaxation. So you recline on your back and close your eyes. I call this rest position. Now go ahead and bend your knees and see math. Yeah. So that the soles of the feet are on the floor. And as soon as you recline, you'll notice there's an obvious downshift in all aspects of your physiology. Your postural muscles are no longer having to fight gravity. And your diaphragm, which lives inside of your ribcage, one of its main jobs is to act as a postural muscle. But now, because it no longer has to face gravity the way it was, it can just be an exclusive respiratory muscle. Begin to watch it. Watch how your diaphragm is behaving without influencing it. So get a sense now of which zone is your breath home, whether your body is in a zone one calm state breath in the gut, whether your body is a little amped and your ribs are flaring, or whether you might be in a little bit of startle or doubt and you're in a zone three breath. For our little lesson here, I'm gonna recommend that you bring this mindset into your body, which is my breath is home. My breath is home. Now I'm gonna talk you through a specific breath pattern, and we're gonna do three systematic check-ins, little tests that we'll revolve back to over the course of the class. The first one is called the abdominal thoracic breath. In the abdominal thoracic breath, you first let your body exhale, and then you'll inhale so that the gut area expands, and then the same inhale travels into the rib area, and they broaden followed by an exhale that migrates out through your nose slowly. In an abdominal thoracic breath, we first manipulate so that the diaphragm descends and you feel its descent by the expansion of the gut, the waist, the low back, the pelvic floor. The same inhale moves up into the bell shape of the ribs and they broaden without strain, followed by an exhale that moves out slowly through your nose. Check-in number two is the diaphragm vacuum. And I'm gonna describe what we're doing while you're doing it, and I'll help you refine it a little bit later. But take the abdominal thoracic breath like you did before. Breathe gut to ribs, get a big breath in, and then now forcefully exhale the air out through your nose or mouth, just get rid of the air. And you can use the muscles of expiration to get rid of the air. Now, once you're empty of the air, don't inhale, relax your guts, but now spread the thorax, spread the ribs apart as if you had taken a zone two breath, a rib cage breath. So the ribs spread, and when you do this, your diaphragm, which lives inside of the rib cage, will stretch towards the ribs, and you'll feel a strange suction in the gut. Go ahead and release that. I'll talk you through it again. Take a catch breath if you need to. That was a very long process. So you breathe, gut to ribs, then get rid of the air, 
empty, empty, and at the end of empty, soften all of your muscles except for the external intercostals, which move the ribs apart, and take a fake inhale, as if you breathed only into the rib cage, and notice if you feel a strange suction, like a, a vacuum forming within your core. Last check-in. The last check-in is irrespective of your breathing. Y'all just bring your hands down by your sides and let your palms face the sky. Let your spine, your head, your pelvis sink into the floor as they are. No need to manipulate anything about your core, but you're gonna drift your arms up overhead into shoulder flexion. And when, you, when you're in, you might need to open your eyes for this, y'all. So check it out. From here, you're just bringing your arms overhead into shoulder flexion. And when you hit a point of your soft tissue end feel, that's where you're gonna stop. So if your spine or your ribs arch away from the floor, you've gone too far. You wanna just find the truth of what is the end feel of my shoulder range of motion right now as it stands. So your arms go overhead, your elbows stay straight, and you wanna get a sense of the difference between the right and the left shoulder as you bring your arms overhead. Bring your arms up overhead, and the point where your ribs start wanting to do this, stop. That's where your shoulder, right? So your shoulder, once you start to feel your shape changing because of the, sh the movement of the shoulder, that's where you want to stop. Great, okay, and then that's enough, and release. Bring your arms down. You've got a hard tissue restriction, the floor is your restriction, you have no restriction. Um, but most people are gonna have some level of soft or hard tissue restriction in, in the shoulder overhead. Um, but we don't wanna translate the spine or the ribs in order to make the arms go to the floor. We just wanna feel what is that available overhead right now. The two balls are gonna go onto a portion of your thoracolumbar aponeurosis. Can I say thoracolumbar aponeurosis in here? Does everybody understand what that is? Maybe not? Okay, so you know the, I'm a, you were, everybody was? Awesome, so this is the, if you ever look at the muscle man illustration, you see this gorgeous white diamond on the lower back and the, the end of the diamond ends at the sacrum and the upper portion of the diamond kind of feathers up into the lower traps, okay. right? You have this diamond. And so where we're gonna place the two gorgeous balls is on a particular aspect of the thoracolumbar aponeurosis, which is the, basically it's the tendons of all of your back muscles, your core muscles. I'll explain it more when we're in there, but we're going to a thing called the lateral wrath. The lateral wrath is a confluence of multiple layers of core muscles, and I'll describe them once we're there. But it's a really simple application. The balls are gonna go there. The balls will not be touching each other. Your sacrum will be on the floor. Your lower back will be off the floor, but we're not looking for a feeling of back bend. And I'll describe this more when you're in it. It's, it's more evident when you're in it than watching me. You can't really tell much here. So make sure it's on your skin if you're comfortable with that. You saw how I exposed my skin here. Because we want to get the skin grip. And Seema's got the right idea. We call this skin for the win. Because there is an interaction with the grippiness of the rubber and the way it's tractioning into different fascial layers as well as into pressure sensors within your skin. So you're gonna to return to the rest position and I'm gonna go through a checklist to make sure you guys are in the right position. Is your sacrum and pelvis on the floor? If it's not, then the balls are too close together. So make sure you can feel the weight of your sacrum and pelvis on the floor. Number two, when you get up to your lower back, it shouldn't feel like you're in a back bend. It shouldn't feel like you're in a torque position. It should feel like there's a sense of wide stretch, of horizontal stretch, odd horizontal stretch across your low back. So your sacrum is on the floor and you feel like there's a hammock between the right and left sides of your lower back. If you feel back bend, the balls are too close. But if you feel something you can't quite process, that's probably correct. All right, what are you feeling there, Mark? You're not sure, that's great. And the not sure is good. As long as we're not feeling back bend, we're in the right thing. You're still feeling a little bit of back bend, Casey? Yeah, okay, so you just move them a little bit further apart is perfect, great. Next, you're feeling that most of your rib cage is on the ground and that your skull is on the ground. Great. So your job right now, folks, is simply to inhale into both of these balls and then let exhale take care of itself. So this is a zone one breath. Each inhale that you take, you're attempting to reach the pressure of your breath 
into the right and left gorgeous balls. And allow your body to heavy itself into the floor. If you could even magnify your body weight, not by force, but, but just by imagining yourself, instead of being on Earth where our gravity is what it is, maybe you're on you know, Mercury where you're like being sucked into the, the very center of the planet. So your diaphragm lives inside of the rib cage. It lines the lower six ribs, including ribs 11 and 12, which are your floaters. So right now, one of the things that you're feeling especially because we're focusing on this inhale, is you're feeling the reach of the posterior aspects of the diaphragm into the right and left balls. Your diaphragm is shaped like a trampoline, a misshapen trampoline. There's a, a liver in the way on the right, so your diaphragm is higher on the right. It's a little bit lower on the left. And so as you're breathing here, into the right and left sides of your diaphragm, into the right and left sides of your lower back, I'm wondering if any of you feel a difference in the, the force generated on the right side versus the left side of the diaphragm. Do any of you notice the difference between the right and left side? But sometimes our, our lower rib angles, they can, they can have a different angle than the other side just because of our habit of how we wear our body. Right? So, so that can, but, but just even having the proprioceptive awareness of that, of that annoying thing that you didn't have before, that's great. So if this is illuminating, maybe, I mean, I don't know, we'd have to give you an x-ray and be like, oh wait, yeah. Andrew's got <laughs> ribs yeah. that are po these guys are poking down. I have a little scoliosis in my spine from, um, I had a hip replacement five years ago. And I had no idea I had scoliosis until I got my new hip. And then I did the scoliosis test and I was like, oh my God, my whole spine is all ricochet because I had been avoiding my degenerating hip for a lifetime, right? The, the scoliosis has balanced itself out now that I have level hips from them. Anyway, okay, so you guys are feeling potentially different on the right and left side or not, but that's cool because you know what? Your diaphragm doesn't want you to feel it. Your diaphragm has nine muscle spindles meaning we don't get a sense of stretch or movement from our diaphragm in a, in a sensory way, in a perceptive way. Typically, when we become aware of our diaphragm, it's because we have the hiccups. But we're not, you can't, I can't sit here and, and you can't tell me exactly where your diaphragm is the way you can tell me, I know where my biceps, is, my biceps are, or I know where my hamstrings or my quads are. We just don't have that feedback from the diaphragm that we have from most of the other skeletal muscles. All right, from here, I mentioned that we're gonna use a number of different things. We're gonna use breathe, roll, and move. Let's take this into movement. And the movement I'm gonna ask you to do is very subtle. On inhale, you're gonna actually exaggerate the position you're in and you're gonna arch your lower back. You're gonna anteriorly tilt your pelvis and allow your lower back to arch. On exhale, you'll reverse the position of your pelvis. You'll posteriorly tilt your pelvis and allow your spine to dive down between the balls. On inhale, you'll anteriorly tilt your pelvis and allow your back to arch. And on exhale, you'll posteriorly tilt your pelvis and allow the low back to dive in between the balls. So you're generating this movement both from your breathing and from the muscles surrounding your pelvis and core but you do indeed move your pelvis and your lower back does indeed follow along the chain of motion coming from the pelvis. And you might notice that as you start to move, you increase the interaction of these soft tissues that are laying upon the ball, upon the balls, uh, with the balls. And so we get a little bit more fascial shear of the multiple layers of muscle that are included in the thoracolumbar fascia and the thoracolumbar aponeurosis, which includes superficially your lats, both layers of your obliques, your transversus abdominis, erector spinae, quadratus lumborum, and psoas. You might also notice as you're moving is that it's not just the lumbar spine that moves, but the thoracic spine moves and the cervical spine moves. And you'll feel your head involuntarily nodding because of the ligamentous connection between pelvis 
and skull. Overhead, again, keeping your torso super heavy on the ground, and notice if your shoulders range of motion has changed at all. And you know, those of you that were paying attention to right and left, noticing if that's changed at all. And, and if that is different, go ahead and raise your hand to the ceiling so I can see if that has been shifty for anybody. For Mark, Casey, is that true for you? Andrew, that's true for you? Great. So did we just spend 15 minutes rolling out the shoulders? Or did we just spend 15 minutes decompressing the lumbar spine, addressing the thoracolumbar fascia, downregulating the nervous system? <laughs> what did we do? Did we just rub out the shoulders for 15 minutes to make that change? No. We actually did. We did all of those. Because the, the largest shoulder muscle you have is what? What's the largest shoulder muscle? What's the largest shoulder muscle? Yeah. Right? Your lats start here and they end here. Right? So that muscle is crossing from pelvis through lumbar, through thor. So it's passing from zone one, zone two, all the way up into the arm. It's the most superficial layer of the thoracolumbar aponeurosis. So while we're decompressing our lumbar spine and using these therapy balls on the surface, you're also agitating that connective tissue and creating an allowance for your shoulder to go into overhead. So we didn't have to you know, do painful rolling here and here. We flipped an autonomic nervous system switch, right? So you're downregulated. You're a lot mellower than you were before. So there's less sympathetic tone, but also we're just generating more elasticity by by the position, right? And we didn't have to. It didn't have to hurt to like get in there and noodle around. It's it's interesting, right? Okay. There's a lot of other stuff going on, but I always think that especially for people that where their shoulder position you know, matters, <laughs> which is like I think everybody. It's nice that we can get it without having to go through this other like 30 minute process of touching every muscle with a ball or a stick or whatever. Okay. Zone two. Ready for zone two? So zone two is going to feel a little bit like zone one in terms of placement, but we're going to do different things there. So for zone two, you're going to take the two gorgeous balls and instead of being on the thoracolumbar aponeurosis and the lateral raft that we were on before, you're going to be on the sides of the ribs. And this is a little rib hammock. Oh, God, I love this. Oh, my God. So when you put the balls on the, the ribs, you want to make sure that you're not on your scapula. In other words, my shoulders should be able to still kind of get down to the floor. And same thing, I'm looking for pelvises on the floor. Obviously, the lumbar is going to be tractioned away from the floor. But what I feel here is horizontal stretch rather than a, a vertical stretch. I'm not feeling back bend. I'm feeling this strange broadening experience. Okay? And then head's on the floor. So go, go for it. Yeah, that's fine. You're just, you're, your shoulders aren't going to go to the ground because they're so big. But you're good. Yep. You can bring them out to the side a little bit. I just want, yes. Okay. I just want as much drape as possible. Does that make sense? There we go. No. Are, are you feeling this sensation or are you feeling this strange hammock sensation? What would you say? I think I'm feeling a little bit of a uh, back bend. Little yeah, bit you of don't want to feel a back bend here. So bring the balls further apart. That's it, Casey. Great. Great. And then, Casey, make, your, make yourself comfortable. Like, this looks awkward. So. I'm awkward. Now, in the, in the lumbar, we did a concentrated inhale, and then we just allowed exhale to happen. So go ahead and start with that right now. But I want you to try to deliberately breathe into the right and left sides of your rib cage, into the right and left gorgeous balls, and then let the exhale happen for you. So the gorgeous balls will help return the serve. They'll help, they'll help return the ribs to a downward position. 
But right now, the, the balls are also giving you the, the wonderful resistance to inhale, so you can start to manipulate the ores of the rib cage itself. There's an incredible neuroscientist that I feature in the book named Jack Feldman, Dr. Jack Feldman, who discovered two different regions in the brainstem. One of them is where inhale is generated. It's called the pre-Botzinger complex. But he also, 20 years later, in about 2001, found the place in the brainstem that also generates exhales in a region called the parafacial nucleus. So we're gonna play around with this right now. We're gonna do a little neural exercise while we're in zone two. So you've been doing your deliberate inhale and passive exhale, but now you're gonna do a deliberate exhale and a passive inhale. And it works like this. You're gonna force your exhale out. Just close your ribs, force the exhale out, then relax and wait for inhale to arrive. When your body has determined that it has inhaled, and it's not gonna be a big quantity, and you're ready for exhale, overtake it by <laughs> forcing the air out. Then relax and let inhale enter. Once it's entered and your body feels like it's taken enough air in, then <laughs> force the exhale out, then relax. So your job is to not help the inhale at all. And then the exhale, <laughs> close the ribs, force them closed, then relax and let inhale enter. And Maybe you can even notice the movements that the diaphragm makes. Now, for many people, this is a vexing exercise. It really stumps them. And if it's stumping you, then go back to the first pattern where you're doing the deliberate inhale and then the passive exhale. But it's really fun in, you know, in doing this type of work to really play around with the emphasis um, within your body in different locations, in different positions, what you're doing with your inhale, what you're doing with your exhale, and then what it means to uh, control of the nervous system and control of respiration. All right, everybody go back to the regular way, which was the first way, the active inhale and passive exhale. And now we're gonna take this into movement. Remember, we're doing breathe, roll, move. So we're already breathing, we're rolling because we're on the balls, but now we're gonna move. You'll take a deliberate inhale, and then on exhale, you'll swing your knees over towards your right elbow, towards the right ball, complete your exhale, and then you'll inhale, swing back through center, my feet go to the floor, and then on exhale, rotating and swinging your knees in the other direction. Inhaling back to center, and exhaling and rotating. You wanna to try to keep both sides of your rib cage planted on the balls as you go. So we're starting to play around with the twisted diaphragm. Uh, the further you can bring your knees up towards your arm, up towards your ball, the better in terms of you know, the dynam dynamism of this exercise for the diaphragm. Your, your diaphragm is this, it's like this cog. It's this semicircle inside of your rib cage. And it, it has to allow for breathing in every possible position. And so as you twist right now, I, I'm, I'm over here, I'm distorting my shape into a million different ways. But no matter how I distort my shape, I can breathe because of the architecture of the diaphragm and the spine. The, the availability of rib motion coupled with diaphragm movement. But the problem is if we don't go to all those places, then our diaphragm and its fascial interfaces render us a feeling of air starvation or like we can't breathe there. Take an abdominal thoracic breath, breathe gut to rib cage and notice the shape of your breath. After you've done that, take another abdominal thoracic breath followed by an exhale that eliminates all the air from your body. And at the end of empty, spread your ribs as if you had inhaled into them and notice if the shape of the diaphragm, the reach of the diaphragm, look at me, Mark. So that's what we're trying to do after, ex after exhale. After I breathe out. After you breathe out, don't breathe in, and then spread the ribs as if you took a rib breath. As if you had a hand and nose over your mouth and you tried to breathe in while there was no air in your body. So you have to let the abs go to do that. Good, then recheck your shoulders. So you bring your hands down by your sides and bring your shoulders up overhead. And notice if 
the 12 minute shoulder massage did anything for your shoulder range. And if your shoulders feel different, more rangy, um, bring your hand to the ceiling so I can see. So the things you might sense are more grace, yes. more um, elegance in the actual movement, right? There's less restriction. Even though you didn't have much, mm -hmm. you got even more graceful, like you needed more grace, yeah. right? Um, other things is less pain at end range. Those are some other like tells that the application was effective, right? Now, did we just rub our shoulders for 12 minutes or did we decompress the thoracic spine, affect the lungs and heart by being in zone two? Again, go down even deeper into the parasympathetic response. If we are, and I am this type of person, if we are the type of person that is kind of a zone two person, like really hype, like really up all the time, um, then what ends up happening is if we don't allow, if our ribs are living in this sort of zone two up, up all the time, eventually it, we start to throw our shoulders into a zone three behavior, right? You can see how I'm talking right now, which is like up here. And the ribs are the house for the shoulders. The ribs are the basement for the shoulders. Your shoulders live on top of them. And so if my ribs never go down, my shoulders never go home either. And so doing a little bit of this, the rib work helps, is like protective against being in a zone three state at all times. So now let's go directly into zone three. And for the zone three, come up to sitting, um, neck anew is the first move that we're gonna do. And so you'll take the gorgeous ball and you'll stick it onto the carotid sheath. We're gonna stick it onto the skin and you're gonna pivot the heck out of the soft tissues on the front of your neck and wring your head from side to side. So you'll rotate your head from side to side as you drill this ball gently um, into the sides of the neck. And as you go across the throat, lighten the pressure. We're trying to <laughs> Uh, deploy physiological relaxation here, so I'm going to make nice. So this is like having a little makeout session with the anterior neck. You're trying to twirl the ball into the skins of the anterior neck, and within that is this wonderful muscle called the platysma. And then deep to that, we actually start to massage against a cool neurovascular bundle that includes the the carotid artery, the jugular vein, and the vagus nerve. And so as we roll across this region, we're giving mechanical pressure to one of the most powerful parasympathetic nerves in the body. And we have been jostling the vagus nerve this whole time, but I haven't called it out. But here we're actually directly adding mechanical pressure uh, to that nerve as you go from side to side. And really screwing the ball, so you're really getting as much traction and grip. So it's not just rolling across, but you're creating a little turbine with the ball again and again. And then we're going to go into a, another diaphragm. So we're going to go into the lateral neck here. So if we think of the respiratory diaphragm inside the rib cage, it's got this horizontality to the muscle. I don't, I mean, we can look at the book, you can see it, but in, in the neck, we have a, a lot of horizontality to uh, the lateral aspects of the of the neck or the upper portion of the shoulders. And we have this verticality here in the column of the neck, but it's kind of cool to th consider this horizontality as, um, as another diaphragm. And some people call this the cervical thoracic diaphragm. And you've probably seen this on Mobility Watt. I did this with Kelly a decade ago, I think on his um, YouTube channel, but the ball is gonna go directly above the collarbone and you're just gonna lean in. And I'm going to give you a few objectives here. So as you lean in this first phase, you want to try to breathe into the ceiling of your lungs. So the yoga tune up ball right now is acting as a doorstop for the first and second ribs. So as I breathe here right now, I'm trying to breathe into the attic of the lungs all the way up into ribs one and two. So that'll be the first like eight breaths. And then the second eight breaths or so you'll take this into movement and you'll scour around and look for different areas of this recess, <laughs> different areas of this recess that it's like a little jacuzzi, 
like especially on me because I'm super bony, but there's this little jacuzzi spot for the yoga tune-up ball to go and rest in. This is called Necknar in the book. But you can parlay the ball and go into the levator scapula, the trapezius. Of course, you're going all over the scalenes. Um, but what we're not doing, we've already gone against the side of the neck. We're not trying to smush the ball into the side of the neck. We're just trying to stay in this horizontal mass, okay? So find yourself somewhere. Give yourself eight breaths in stillness and try to perceive the first and second rib. And then eight breaths of just play. And then let your head rest against the side of the apparatus so that you're using as little muscle force to maintain your posture. Oh, that works immediately. <laughs> I gotta show her the bar and the rack move. Because the bar, you can twist it. Oh my God, it kills you. So you're doing those eight breaths and just trying to feel the subtlety of right, that uplift of rib one and two. And then start to play. And then after those eight, then just start maneuvering around. You can move your shoulder. You can move your shoulder in all different ways. Um, now, there, we have a variety of different sizes of the balls that feel really good. The alpha ball feels amazing here. I'll leave a set with you guys to play around with. You have some at home. No, the alpha is much bigger. bigger yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, switch sides, guys. All, it's all the parasympath it's 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 the parasympathetic response. So um, I didn't realize how bad it smells in here either. I'm yeah, sorry. sorry. And I can breathe better. <laughs> sorry guys. <laughs> yeah, you get very sensitive. Uh, when you were mentioning uh, some of your digestive issues when you were younger, um, you know, diving into the running world, I've run into so many runners that have had uh, you know stomach issues. And then they're like, what came first? Were they smaller framed and got into running? And then they developed stomach issues from so much running? Or, you know, or, or, is it, or is it that they couldn't eat that much? So they were a smaller person, so running fit them well. It's kind of an interesting thing. But some of the information I've heard is just that when you continuously do something such as running for four or five, sometimes these guys are doing it for a really long time. And yeah, it's very stressful, right? and that it somewhat mimics a little bit of almost leaky gut to wow. some extent while you're exercising. So stressful. Well, you're, you're in sympathetic the whole time. Yeah. Especially you're doing marathons. You're like, oh, well, I'm just going gonna, gonna to do 26.2 miles of not relaxing today. Yeah. That's tough. And then they try to like consume stuff while you're running. Uh, right, right, right. Yeah, and it's paradoxical. To, right. It's like kind of. You can't digest when you're. Sort of can, but not really. You can, but right. You can, but you can. It's not a. It's not a perfect thing. But yeah. So we're still in zone three, and then we're going to go into zone two, but or go through all three zones. But in this zone three release, this is what everybody wants to do when they get a pair of yoga tune-up balls. They want to go right there and there. But now we're going to press into them, and you can easily press into them. We're going to go into this position. You'll lift your pelvis up onto the gorgeous ball and then you'll just place the yoga tuna balls on either side of the neck. And so I have an easy marker because I have my bra straps here, but that's pretty much where you want to go, your backpack straps. And then once you get into that position, you'll start to <laughs> manipulate like your upper body so that you can tool around the upper inner border of the shoulder blade. One of the cool, uh, neurological things about working on the upper traps is the upper traps are innervated by the accessory nerve and the accessory nerve shares source nuclei with the vagus and the brainstem and what this means to your vagus is that the massage of the traps as well as any massage of the neck or face ends up giving you an amplification of parasympathetic virtues you feel it into your ears yeah, it feels really good. Oh, good. That's the first time anybody's ever said that. That's very strange. Okay, the two therapy balls are going to go along the spine. This is the other thing everybody wants to do, but I'm going to add something to this. Want to try to connect your back breath into the balls. So as you breathe in, you want to try to displace the pressure of breathing into the locuses of the balls. There's a lot of people who are very, very deconditioned or who live in a lot of pain. This is just their own body weight on balls is just too much. And so uh, we'll modify this by going against a wall quite frequently. And you'll get the same exact response. 
I mean, there's a few things that are different, but you'll get a similar response. So if you put your hands behind your head, you'll be able to roll up and down, take the ball off your tush. You think of this as a, a, an unbridled peanut, and you're, they're, just, they're just finding their way down the spine. You can also do this in the tote, where they're, where they're really very strictly, yeah, there's the sort of strictly dealing vertebrae vert by vertebra. And in the bookmark, there's a number of different um, angles that we use with the back rolling. Oh, the so these, these are compressible rubber, so they, they allow for bony prominences plug. to dive into them. And so you, you get to catch all the tissues around a joint junction. So there's a lot of valuable real estate that you can't get with a hard tool. Take the yoga tuna balls out and put your sacrum back up on the, on the ball. This will be our last little thing. Again, return to breathe, roll and concentrate on the movement of our breath. So your pelvis is uplifted. And Andrew, I saw you do this earlier. You, you could have both balls underneath your buns if you want. Uh, that's, as long as they're even, that's totally cool. Or you can just have the one ball on the sacrum. My breath is home. My breath is home. Look at my hands. I'm gonna teach you guys this. This is called the OK symbol. And you're gonna have a light pressure of the index and thumb finger and just let your hands rest on the ground. But the index and thumb finger are just lightly touching. And you use a minimum of force to get the fingers there. And then your fingers will just stay there, because skin is kind of gluey anyway. And just let the fingers rest upon each other. Now, for the past hour, you've been concentrating on a number of different breath patterns. Focus in on an inner listening. This is called the internal metronome breath. An inner listening of your pulse. Notice, if you can, the feeling of your pulse, the throb, in the fingertips that are currently touching. If your fingers right now are kind of numb to that feeling, they can't sense it, why don't you bring a hand to your own physical heart and see if you can feel your heartbeat there, or you can bring it to the side of your neck at the carotid and feel it there. So if you can't feel it at the fingertips, you can try feeling it here. Yeah. And you're gonna construct a breath practice now around this pulse. You'll inhale for six heartbeats, hold for four, exhale for eight heartbeats, and hold for four. In six, hold four, out eight, hold four. Thoracic breath. The next abdominal thoracic breath will be followed by that exhale, which is followed by the diaphragm vacuum. So you get rid of the air and feel that strange suction from pelvic floor to throat. And when you can no longer hold that, hold that for as long as you plausibly can. When you can no longer hold that, recheck your shoulder range. Your hands come down by your sides and then you slowly swipe them up overhead. Now that we've gone through zone one, zone two, and zone three releases, see what your joint range of motion has registered. Andrew, you notice the difference? Yeah. Oh my God, winner, winner, chicken dinner. My breath is home, amazing. So maybe, you know, the, the, the change of range is that I need to go into the softer side of my nervous system and address my soft tissue in a really tender way and be more systematic about addressing it there. I mean, I don't know what you do, but it's like that was startling from start to finish, you know. So you want to put one hand underneath your rib cage. Make it like a little diaphragm. And then your other hand in front of your sternum, kind of like a half heart. This is my little universal symbol of thank you from the bottom of my heart, which is, of course, my diaphragm. The diaphragm is the mattress that the heart sits on. And as your diaphragm moves, your heart goes up and down. Did you know that? Thank you from the bottom of my heart, which is, of course, my diaphragm. And yours and yours and yours. Thank you, guys. Thank you. You appreciate it. You're welcome.